Saturday night. Uh, welcome to the uh, people who have come from far and distant places like the Bay Area. <laughs> it's nice to see some faces from uh, haven't seen for a few months. And maybe some new faces. <laughs> but um, yeah, motoring through our winter retreat. Having just passed Valentine's Day, thought a few words on loving kindness <laughs> might be useful to uh, differentiate it from Valentine's Day sentiments <laughs> a little bit. But uh, we've also um, a lot of the themes um, around practice. Uh, and in uh, discussions, uh, check-ins with people, have often uh, returned and hovered around the, the theme of a suba practice this year. Uh, there's been a fair amount of discussion with that um, contemplation of the body, contemplation of the 32 parts of the body, a suba practice. And, um, very important mind training uh, and um, very uh, useful practice for many different uh, reasons. And uh, we've also discussed one of the some of the teachings around uh, uh, balancing that. Uh, the we've mentioned uh, the Megiya Sutta a couple of times where the uh, Buddha talks about uh, developing, uh, at least uh, to help stabilize, uh, stabilize the mind uh, uh, with a, several essential tools of practice, several contemplations, and um, four that he points out with uh, specificity are the Asubha practice, the uh, practice of, of metta bhavana, development of loving kindness or goodwill, uh, and the development of uh, contemplation of impermanence, anicca, sanya, the perception of impermanence, uh, and, uh, uh, and actually prior to that, uh, anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. Those four uh, are sort of four tools that everybody should have in their, in their meditation toolkit. So I've been thinking to mention a few words about metta, uh, translated often as loving kindness, um, uh, perhaps uh, a little bit more appropriately in some of our minds as goodwill, uh, the development of goodwill. Both um, asuba and metta um, are used as oftentimes reflected on as specific antidotes to uh, obstructive mind states, asuba for uh, sensual craving and metta for, uh, as an antidote for ill will or uh, aversion. But both of them in and of themselves, uh, and in a sense particularly metta, are um, worthy contemplations to develop in and of themselves, just with that, you know, without necessarily having to be an antidote to anything, um, but uh, just very, very, particularly uh, thinking about metta, very beautiful, sublime uh, mind states, uh, regardless of whether there's a, there's a strong presence of uh, ill will or not. And Sometimes if we just concentrate too much on development of, say, some of the uh, practices that are um, specifically geared towards abandoning uh, neg you know, negative mental states or uh, states like um, sensual craving, then if there's kind of the wrong kind of, of striving or excessive striving, uh, the mind 
can be can become uh, if it's if it's picked up too too vigorously or without wisdom, the mind can become quite tight or uh, constricted, um, and we need to make sure that we balance that um, those kinds of uh, strong um, practices with with uh, with practices that open the mind, open the heart, uh, and allow for uh, spaciousness uh, and uh, very positive uh, states of mind. It's not that the, say, the Asuba practices don't result in, in positive states of mind. When the fevers are cooled, uh, that's, very, that's very positive. But if picked up unwisely, uh, can result in tightness, uh, constriction. So we need to have other tools at hand uh, as well. Both of them, all of them, you know, have to be within the presence of a strong uh, development of, of sati sampajanya, mindfulness and clear awareness, so that we have this ability to pull ourselves into uh, this moment to know clearly w what state of mind we are practicing with and the results of the practices that we do pick up so that we see clearly uh, the effect that these different contemplations are having and to adjust as we need to adjust the, to keep the balance. So uh, very important to have that uh, sensitivity, present moment, calling ourselves uh, into the moment uh, with an inquisitive mind that says, well, okay, what is, what is really the state? What's happening now? Uh, how would it be useful for me to direct my attention? So metta, um, all of these uh, Brahma Viharas uh, have, have their um, descriptions uh, and some comparisons uh, that come more in the commentaries, but a useful one that I find is looking at what the, uh, the near enemies are. Uh, so what, sometimes we can get confused with what actually something like metta uh, is all about. Um, and need to differentiate that quality of uh, goodwill uh, that the Buddha talks about developing as a, as a Brahma Vihara, uh, making sure that we're not confusing it with states of affection, uh, states of, of what we would normally call love um, that lead to attachment uh, because as we all know, is uh, attachment, clinging, uh, is uh, the root, one of the root causes of, of, of suffering, uh, holding tightly um, to an object of, of desire. Uh, uh, when that changes, <laughs> we all know uh, there's uh, pain involved, dukkha involved. So being careful not to confuse metta either conceptually or actually at a very deep practice level not to confuse it with attachment and that takes that presence of sati sampajanya uh, and, and discernment, wisdom uh, to be able to ferret that out. <clears throat> when is loving kindness uh, morphing into uh, sensual desire at, at, at one extreme or more subtly into uh, say, emotional attachment. Uh, so it's good to, to keep that in mind and to look at the relationships uh, we have in the world and, and uh, see uh, how we are holding them. Romantic love is a, is a biggie, of course. Um, people who haven't committed themselves to a monastic life or a celibate life um, generally uh, will seek uh, uh, an experience in the world of, 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 of finding a partner. Uh, and certainly that is a very skillful way um, to uh, live uh, in relationship in the world uh, uh, for, for, for non 
for people who aren't practicing uh, celibacy, uh, having a stable relationship uh, rather than being um, always uh, on the search uh, or uh, having multiple relationships, things like that, can, can lead to, to more stability uh, in, in one's life. Uh, and if it's a healthy relationship, uh, and I think there are some of them out there, <laughs> not all, but uh, some healthy relationships uh, that can be uh, stabilizing, uh, nurturing, uh, and uh, helping people uh, keep a balance in their lives. And it's also interesting to kind of watch that energy, to watch uh, when, when you're not in, a, if a person's not in a relationship, to, to watch and see the strength of um, the pull uh, towards that kind of, of what we would call romantic, romantic love. It's a very potent uh, energy uh, that can you know, involve and, and um, involve a lot of time and energy uh, in establishing. It's a very strong force of becoming, uh, that seeking out of uh, a relationship, uh, and um, that level of intensity uh, during the search for uh, not only a you know a, a sensual or sexual relationship, but also uh, one that's uh, helping to ground the emotional base, uh, can be quite uh, consuming. And to notice that uh, if if one is in that particular mode of uh, entering uh, into a relationship or, or seeking to enter a relationship. And just to notice the intensity of that uh, movement of mind uh, that, can, that can happen. And then when a potential relationship is, is there, the all-consuming uh, nature uh, in those initial stages. It's, it's interesting to watch sometimes from a the point of view uh, of living in a monastic community, uh, the world around us and the people that come and go and, and um, oftentimes people who are associated with the community in Dhamma practice or, or just Dhamma practitioners um, out in the world, uh, uh, if they leave a relationship or if a relationship ends, then we tend to see them a whole lot more in the monastery. Uh, uh, oftentimes becoming, you know, quite regular attendees and uh, supporters. And, and then uh, when another relationship starts to happen, uh, where did they go? <laughs> and can often disappear for weeks and months and years at a time uh, because of the, the nature of forming a new relationship it tends to be very intense and very consuming. And, Oftentimes, romantic love wins over Dhamma. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just not that that's a, you know, a, a bad thing um, in any way uh, in terms of seeking out that kind of uh, stability, you know, eventual stability in, in one's relationships. Um, but uh, just noticing the intensity of, of, of the amount of time and energy and commitment it takes to, to enter into that. And then, you know, that kind of uh, love or affection uh, in a relationship uh, will, uh, if it's uh, nurtured in the right way and grown, uh, grown with wisely, uh, can uh, then oftentimes move into a more mature kind of uh, relationship with another being if it's a committed one. And. Uh, can kind of settle into something that's not uh, quite so uh, intense or agitating or involving, um, and settle into a more uh, level, higher level of, of uh, ease uh, and uh, genuine support, uh, the emotional bonds are often still strengthening. Um, and, uh, and if one, isn't much of a Dhamma practitioner or if isn't cognizant of these, the, the level of attachment uh, can increase in a different way. 
in towards that long-term uh, commitment with one other being uh, or possibly expanding to, uh, expanding to a family unit um, with a certain intensity of, of emotional dependence. Uh, if, if not seen clearly or wisely, then um, uh, one, even if it's a, a useful, and it can be a very useful, healthy mirror uh, in that kind of relationship, that kind of partnership, um, people can be excellent mirrors for each other and learn quite a bit about themselves and each other and their uh, skills uh, develop uh, in that way, relationship skills uh, for some very fruitful um, uh, development of the heart. If it is dependent on one other being uh, for that kind of level of, of support and development, then um, it tends to be um, one that is going to result in some sort of difficulty or pain when that changes, when that stability changes. And to just bring that into conscious awareness uh, that someday uh, that relationship is going to change, uh, whether it's through growing apart and separation, people moving in different directions, or uh, if not that, then through uh, eventually uh, old age uh, and death uh, will bring a separation to uh, all of those kinds of relationships. So to use that as a contemplative tool to help reduce uh, the clinging, the grasping um, that uh, we can enter into uh, It, it can be particularly uh, in these kinds of relationships, and it doesn't have to be just like partners, like uh, uh, you know, people who are in partnership with each other, but also uh, other layers of familial relationships, uh, parents, children, um, brothers and sisters. Uh, there's certain levels of uh, emotional attachment, bonding uh, that occurs with those. Uh, and when those uh, inevitably start to uh, change or dissolve, uh, there is that, that sense of, of grief, separation from the, the love, this dukkha. We chant it most every morning, separation from the like, separation from the love, this dukkha. And how to work with that uh, to develop our uh, understanding uh, of how we can be released from that, uh, that kind of dukkha as well. That time when somebody is starting to pass away, uh, whether it's a parent or a, uh, a sibling or a, maybe a partner, um, or uh, in some circumstances, people lose their children. Um, if it's done with awareness uh, and with uh, willingness to, to learn, uh, learn from it, then it can be a very fruitful experience uh, to see um, very clearly the differences, say, between uh, attachment and pure love. I had a very fortunate experience of um, spending uh, a relatively uh, fair amount of time, particularly towards the end of my mother's life. Uh, a couple of years ago, she passed away at the age of uh, 92, almost 92. And um, over <clears throat> a number of years uh, of gradual decline. Um, but um, both myself and, and my uh, sister and, and uh, her family. Uh, she was the more the primary caregiver, even though my mother never lived in their house. Uh, my sister was sort of the close attendee on hand to help managing, but I was able to spend some time also uh, going back and visiting. And, and over that last bit of time in particular, um, I think all of us through, through conscious reflection 
uh, and talking and, and even meditation, um, we're able to maybe um, readjust some of how we experience that relationship uh, with her uh, in her waning years. Uh, and by the time uh, it came for her to escape her very painful aging body uh, and move on, um, by that time, I think, you know, we had been able to work through and, and let go some of the, the more gnarly attachments that uh, can occur in uh, a parent-child relationship. And uh, experience a level of, of peace and contentment with her passing that I've never experienced before at that level of, of, of intensity and beauty. Um, and oftentimes people uh, during that last bit of a process or, or soon afterwards would say, well, um, you know, are you grieving? Do you feel sad? Um, uh, was it a hard experience? And, and um, it wasn't without emotion, but m my experience was 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 one of no. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't difficult. It wasn't sad on an emotional basis. It was very moving. Uh, it was very poignant. Um, but the sense was actually, uh, particularly in the last day, she was taking her last breaths, and we were all gathered around my sister, myself, and my two nephews and their partners were all there. And um, just the, the incredible level of peace uh, as she uh, took her last breaths and then stopped. Um, and we had prepared ourselves for it and talked about let, you know, like not to let ourselves get too exuberantly overwhelmed with emotion in her presence while she was passing, that that could be very agitating for her and, and to maybe you know, not get into touching the body too much. That could be distracting for her as she's making her plans to leave. But um, just to try and be there peacefully, reassuringly uh, with her and let her know that we were there, but not to, to be engaging in any kind of uh, overt clinging or emotion, uh, and then just to, to be quiet. Uh, and it was one of the most profound experiences I think that all of us have, have had, and to share that. And when she took her last breath, there was just this incredible uh, open metta and peace uh, that accompanied that. And uh, we all felt so so fortunate uh, to to be able to experience that. Uh, and to me, that was just like a real clear example of uh, goodwill and, and loving kindness without attachment. Um, there was no sense of this shouldn't be, uh, this is a loss, this is the wrong thing. There was no sense of, of that. Um, and. Uh, you know, some people might think, oh, well, there's some denial or repression there, but it, it never felt like that. It still doesn't. So I think the potential is there if one wants to develop that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, mental state in regards to even people you're very, very close to. And a period of transition, dying, um, is a prime opportunity to, to really look at that and make that differentiation between attachment and, um, and goodwill, kindness, love, loving kindness without uh, that kind of uh, stickiness. Interestingly, a couple, a couple of years ago at one of the uh, elders meetings we had in England, uh, a topic came up of uh, monastics and their role in caring for uh, relatives. Uh, and it was a, a fruitful discussion. Um, and I was able to at least relate some of my experience and how involved to get it was kind of the theme, how involved to get with that process. Because, you know, as the Buddha talks about, um, 
we all have a great debt to our parents um, for providing us with all the supports and bringing us up um, and caring for us for, for many, many years. And so that the uh, debt of gratitude is, is very high and the wish to repay that. So where does that come? How does that come about for, for monastics? And um, there's a whole wide range of experience, of course. Um, and uh, occasionally, even uh, some monastics having to provide a substantial amount of support for uh, aging uh, and dying parents. Um, but basically, even those people who had done that level of caring have, uh, were, were quick to point out that that's not necessarily the ideal for uh, a samana, for one gone forth from the household life into homelessness, into the monastic training. Um, and that those kinds of familial connections, uh, you know, the Buddha recommended really um, not severing, but uh, in any way whatsoever, but, but really pulling back from direct day-to-day -day, uh, involvement um, to really devote oneself and one's energy to uh, this pursuit of liberation, um, that it took uh, a withdrawal from uh, that kind of deep social familial connection, not that it's eliminated, but that it's, um, uh, you know, it's not uh, part of the, uh, the daily routine as it is a, as a, um, a householder. So it's a tricky line, you know, where does one support and honor uh, those relationships and, and, and make sure that needs are, are met and people are cared for versus getting overly uh, enmeshed uh, with those kinds of situations. So, and what I'm talking now is, is really geared towards the monastics here, not, not towards the lay community who have a different set of responsibilities but um, just for the monastic community to, to keep that into consideration. And uh, Buddha even talks about it in his simile of, of gold, refining gold, um, where uh, little by little, uh, using the simile of uh, washing out the impurities of rocks and stones, grit uh, from uh, that's entwined and enmeshed with the gold in order to try and purify, to get down to the pure gold, going through several stages of refinement, of uh, washing out these things and starting with the gross impurities of, you know, uh, unskillful actions in body and speech uh, through use of precepts uh, and then moving more towards uh, eliminating the, the stronger, grosser tendencies, obstructions of the mind like ill will and um, harmfulness or cruelty and uh, craving, uh, working to eliminate those. And then after those are eliminated uh, and you're moving down to what he calls the fine grit uh, of the mind, um, looking at uh, how uh, attachment to clan, to uh, the village, families, one's upbringing, um, is one of those, uh, that, that level of attachment uh, to the extent that it's there is, is a, uh, an impurity essentially to be removed, uh, particularly aiming, I think in this case, again at the monastics, uh, but still uh, using the uh, simile of, or the description of attachment, whether you're lay or monastic, uh, I think is useful. And uh, washing that away, that fine grit until one is left with thoughts of Dhamma, uh, which then can even be used and let go of to get down to um, more of a purity of mind. But that that attachment to family, attachment to um, uh, those old structures is, is something that a samana needs to pay attention to uh, in refining the mind, uh, letting go. So to be able to do that skillfully, uh, not neglecting one's duties, but to, to notice and be aware of that more refined kind of uh, mental attachment. 
I was fortunate enough to be able to kind of negotiate that line by uh, providing a fair amount of assistance uh, to my sister from a distance while still living in the monastery. So being able to do, you can do a lot of helping and organizing over the internet and, you know, I actually ended up managing quite a bit of her finances and, and um, even purchasing medications uh, from online pharmacies and getting them sent. So I was able to help a lot, but still be present uh, at the, in the monastery. So uh, with some diligence, maybe there are ways that people can, monastics can, can be involved without having to commit oneself to being on site and, and getting uh, lost in, in those kinds of uh, activities uh, and neglecting one's duties as a, as a monastic and developing the monastic life and training. So it was, a, it was a rich topic of discussion that time and I think gave a lot of food for thought. But then developing um, uh, the more refined or more uh, pure state of, of how we can uh, exp uh, show goodwill, how we can develop goodwill that's maybe not quite so uh, specific uh, to a particular being or a small group of beings. And that's the advantage, I think, of, of um, you know, people often say, well, you know, to monastics, don't you, you know, m miss the um, intimacy or the um, uh, quality of uh, caring and love that a, uh, one can find uh, in a relationship? To, isn't that, to, don't you find things kind of uh, dry or emotionless or, um, you know, yeah, kind of sterile uh, without those kinds of relationships? And, you know, what I experience and what I think many experience is that actually uh, being free of that uh, attachment to one being or a couple of beings, a few beings in, in you know, very at intense uh, emotional uh, relationships, uh, being free of that allows me and others, I think, to experience a, m a much broader state of of loving kindness that's applicable uh, and expandable to all beings. Uh, so um, the more we um, don't have to uh, steer all of our energies into cultivating and nurturing uh, very intense uh, close relationships with one or two people, the more we're free to allow that caring, concern, kindness, gentleness to um, be inclusive uh, to more people. And as we cultivate uh, true metta, true goodwill, then it can become all-encompassing, non-exclusive. Uh, and that can be done in the, in, you know, in the uh, lay community as well, the lay world, even in the household life, uh, if one brings that into conscious awareness. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, developed in that way to lessen the actual attachment while still maintaining the sense of caring uh, and uh, goodwill to the people that we are around. So it's getting all the benefits of, of that state of mind and releasing it from the constrictions that sometimes come along with it if it's if it's not uh, that pure kind of, of goodwill, if there's attachments involved with it, um, that uh, to the extent that there is attachment uh, and expectation and dependence uh, on that particular uh, kind of, of love, uh, that's the extent to which uh, it is limited. Uh, so there's lots of different techniques that people have heard and practiced probably, uh, oftentimes based on some of the commentary, uh, commentarial ways of developing it with the, the recitations and the um, uh, reflections uh, gradually uh, sending out metta to broader and broader groups uh, from oneself to uh, those who are close and dear uh, to 
neutral people to people who we have struggles with and then broadening to all beings eventually in, in different ways that that's developed and taught uh, using verbal recitation as a, as a cue. And that's, uh, I'm sure many people have uh, experienced great benefit from that. I think some of us, and sometimes myself, can find that a bit um, formulaic at times, uh, or, or, or a bit dry if it just becomes the words. Uh, sometimes it can become that. Um, and uh, so we experiment with different ways to make it real and to make it um, uh, tangible. And to, and to bring it in, because the purpose is to actually develop this, what we would call the metanimita, the actual experience of, of loving kindness, not just uh, conceptual thoughts of what, uh, of what it is or words that represent it, but to actually experience the feeling of it uh, and to develop that uh, and to allow it to naturally grow uh, and um, absorb into, uh, it can become a full absorption when developed to its, its fullness, the full development of um, the Brahma Viharas are called boundless states, uh, limitless states uh, of mind. And what I find uh, nurturing for, for myself in that development is actually holding a, a, maybe a slightly different approach where um, the uh, the feeling, uh, the, the sign of it is established through usually some sort of uh, an initial recollection. And sometimes it's words uh, in the traditional way and oftentimes more it's a visual image of someone who's been kind, supportive, and that uh, I you know, have an immense amount of uh, gratitude for the, the care and attention that was given to me in, in a, maybe a difficult circumstance. Um, or in a situation like uh, I was describing with my mother's passing, just bringing that image uh, of that several hour period as she took her last breath and the peace and calm and expansive sense of, of kindness and love that came with that, just bringing that up as a memory, as a perception. Um, something to establish that sense of, of uh, loving peacefulness, uh, or goodwill peacefulness that is very soothing and settling and something that feels like you want to just settle into and, and be with and absorb into. And establishing that very firmly, uh, however, what object you take up to, to establish that. And then staying there with it, staying right in the center of that sphere of, of goodwill, uh, that peacefulness. Uh, and rather than starting to, starting to you know, like send it out uh, in all the directions or to individuals and groups, um, rather than sending it out, um, there was one Thai uh, meditation teacher who taught, and I found it very useful to just stay with it and keep it in your own center uh, of awareness, very, very firmly grounded in um, Sati Sampajanya, mindfulness, and even grounded within the body, but with that very strong metta nimitta, that metta feeling of warmth or gentleness or kindness, uh, expansiveness, and allowing uh, various, inviting in a sense, various different images of, of people who are close, people, your teachers, people, your parents, or uh, fellow monastics, gradually inviting them into that space, but without leaving that, that particular center. Um, and allowing uh, gradually that conscious um, experience to expand, to become larger, um, uh, larger and larger, but still maintaining that uh, very firmly grounded uh, presence uh, right here in, in this body, um, but with a, a very strong presence of, of goodwill, of metta, that then can be a space where you can invite other beings of 
whether they're people that are easy to be with, people difficult to be with, groups of beings that you don't even know, just to gradually expand the space to allow more and more and more to, to enter into that space and to be there. So I find that a very uh, useful imagery for myself in, in development of metta bhavana, uh, development of metta, um, rather than as uh, a conceptual exercise that then one tries to um, radiate, move, you know, to, to, move, to move out from one um, uh, and lose one's base. And then it becomes very uh, present, uh, something to absorb into, and, uh, but not to lose one's balance. So this is a space of, of mind, a space of heart that can be taken to uh, even what can be you know, called a, a, at least a temporary liberation, uh, ceta vimuti, the, the ceta vimuti liberation of the mind or the release of awareness, a release of awareness based on, on loving kindness if it's developed to its fullness, acting as a, a very firm grounding for uh, further development of, of, of the practice. And it's also just a really nice place to hang out for a while. So, and it's from that kind of kindness too that I think that um, we can be our most effective uh, in relationship to the world if we can uh, develop that kind of uh, relationship with other beings, then um, that's a space in which um, we can really offer support and help uh, to others, uh, to each other uh, from, that, from that sphere, rather than uh, one that is based on expectation of return uh, for, for something or you know, uh, a kind of uh, a attachment that um, is dependent on a certain set of uh, causes and conditions of, of, of presence of one or a few other beings. Because if we develop the, the broad, unattached form of, of, uh, of goodwill, um, then it doesn't matter who's in our lives. Uh, we don't have to have a particular set of beings around us. We are, you know, this kind of uh, love is universal and trans transferable. It's not dependent on uh, the specific um, particular uh, narrow causes and conditions. So really encouraging people to develop this, however it works, whatever technique works, but to bring it into consciousness now, it's a, um, we really have to, to nurture these uh, expansive and positive states of mind um, as part of the development, as part of our right effort uh, to developing wholesome states of mind that are supportive uh, conditions uh, for our practice. If we get too narrow or too fixed or too tight uh, or too rigid or demanding and really trying to uh, kill the defilements, uh, kill the negative states of mind, it can become kind of a, uh, you know, not very pleasant uh, state of being. You can get pretty tight and we start to look for uh, relaxation and pleasure in uh, less skillful ways. So really uh, allowing this kind of um, open, beautiful states of mind based on, on goodwill, on compassion, joy, equanimity, uh, really nurturing those, giving time to uh, developing and absorbing, if possible, uh, into these 
very, very uh, beautiful and uh, liberating uh, states of mind. So I'll leave that there for a Saturday night reflection. <laughs>